here in Facebook land. Welcome to Bible class, January 17th, 2021. Open up to Matthew 13, that's where we're gonna start. All right, Matthew 13, parable of the sower. Matthew 13, three through 23. Uh, <clears throat> the same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Large crowds gathered around him, got into the boat, sat in it. All the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, a farmer went out to sow a seed. As he was scattering his seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil, sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seeds fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seeds fell on good soil, where it produced a crop a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. He who has ears, let him hear. <clears throat> the disciples came to him and asked, Why do you speak to the people in parables? He replied, The knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. <clears throat> Whoever has will be given more. And he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has, will be taken from him. That is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will ever be hearing, but never understanding. You will ever be seeing, but never perceiving. For these people's hearts have become callous. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are you eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. For I tell you the pro-truth, many prophets and righteous men long to see what you see, but did not see it, to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The one who receives the seed that fell on rocky places is the man who hears the word, <clears throat> and at once receives it with joy. But since he has no root, he lasts only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, he quickly falls away. The one who receives the seed that fell among the thorns is the man who hears the word. But the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it, make it unfruitful. But the one who receives the seed that fell on good soil is the man who hears the word and understands it. He produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. So 23 verses there are quite lengthy, <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> I have a question of why does Jesus speak in parables? The disciples ask him that question in verse 10, and he gives quite a lengthy uh, answer. So um, how do you summarize Jesus' answer in your life? Why are there parables in the Bible? Why does he use this type of speech and language? For simple people. For simple people. All right. So, <clears throat> Gary, you may have something there. Um, simple people don't look for things too deep. Right? So, on the surface, these disciples, again, they were fishermen. They were not highly educated people. And they hear the story, and they maybe are not using a whole bunch of education to understand it. It's a very simplistic understanding. And that's one thing is about parables. Sometimes you can go too deep and you can get off the beaten path, so to speak, with this parable. Um, what's another reason why you would summarize? How would you answer the question? They're relatable. They relate, they're relatable. Speak in parables for relational purposes. It's something that people understand in their life. You just kind of wonder, about Jesus and his life experiences. Do you ever think he saw this in person as a kid growing up? So was going out, so was he? Yeah, and how he would just take a, a normal, trite behavior and add some depth to it. All right. So, but the answer that Jesus gives of why he speaks in parables is, does anyone really make sense of that? Why does he speak in parables? I mean, how would you understand what he says after that? How does Jesus answer that question? He speaks in parables because... Huh? We don't understand. 
we don't understand. Okay. So now we're getting a little bit closer to following what Jesus' answer is to that response. He speaks in parables because verse 15, why does he speak in parables? Because if he speaks too plainly, he says the response would be, otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. Now there is an issue. You know, it's almost like I'm speaking in parables because I don't want to heal them. What's the verse about seeking him with your whole heart? It's in Psalms somewhere. You know, I'm not really sure uh, what verse it is, but my... Uh, my researcher over there in the corner, Leticia Rutan, can find it for you. Um, she is the assigned researcher on Google. So, seek the Lord. The one that says, if you seek him and you seek him with all your heart, you will find him. Right. It's in Psalm. So, as she's looking that up for you. Yeah. Would, well, this, this happens like in daily life. If you say something literally, and people take it literally, then then they can work at trying to trip you up. If Jesus is talking in parables, they have a hard time tripping you up. And they also have a hard time saying that's what you meant, to use him to bring up against charges when they're going to send him on the cross. So that's, that's a that's an insight that could be true. It would be in Deuteronomy 4.29, but, but from there you will seek the Lord with God, and you will find him when you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. That's in Deuteronomy. It's also in First Chronicles that says it also, and in James 4.8, and in Luke 11. <laughs> there you go. See, every pastor needs one of those. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of funny because before we class started i said to her leticia you know you're my research assistant back there in the corner so and then you asked the question yeah she came through <laughs> oh we'll see we'll see keep that phone open um i, I i'm going to give you my read i'm going to try and throw um 13 into 13 through 15 together uh, though seeing they do not see, though hearing they do not hear understand. Uh, people aren't going to get these parables because it's a prophecy, it's a fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah. Uh, you will be ever hearing but never understand, you will be ever seeing but never perceive, and for these people's hearts to become calloused. There is a clue. For these people's hearts, be, what are they calloused to? Hmm? Being called their sinners. Being told they're sinners, what are they? What other things could they be calloused to? They're callous to the truth. They're callous to the prophecy of the Messiah. They don't. They've had it. They're callous, which means their skin is hardened. Their hearts are hardened. That they can't get it through the thickness of the callous. Why have they become callous? What does Jesus say in verse 15? Why have they become callous? Why have they actually brought the calluses upon their hearts and their ears and their eyes? Because what would they have to admit if they would remove those calluses? They're stubborn. They're, stubborn. they're sinful. They're hopeless. They're wrong. And the last thing they want, and the very end of it there, verse 15, the last thing they want God to do for them is what? Heal them. They don't want me to heal them. Because it's an admission of their guilt. It's an admission of their incompetency. They don't want me to help them. So that's why they're callous. I mean, that's the same thing in our world today. People don't like to hear about their sin. People don't like to hear about their shortcomings with God. I mean, the confessions in our church bodies and our worship services are going out the window. Hearts have become calloused because they don't want to be healed. Because healing means for the Christian that they have no ability to 
heal themselves. And what does that mean to our ego? It's a big old bruise. <laughs> we cannot heal ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, God's plan through the instructional book manual of the scriptures. Jesus would love to heal them, but over the course of time, they don't want it because it humbles them too much. And... Uh, their hearts and eyes and everything's become callous. And so the parables, if they if their if their hearts and eyes weren't so callous like the disciples, they'd maybe get it. But they're so ingrained in their own idea of work righteousness. They're so ingrained in anything of the gospel is just totally goes right behind it. And so what does the word do to them? When Jesus speaks the word to people who are calloused, does it heal them or convict them? It can fix them. That's why I look at Isaiah 55 when I look at this parable, uh, 55, 11, you know, when you want to, want to turn to Isaiah 55, 11, and it might be verse 10, Isaiah 55, 10 and 11, if you read those two verses for me, someone who was very quick to find things. Yes. And did not return to it without watering the earth and making it bring forth new plants. Yield seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So is my word. It goes out to my mouth. It will not return to me. But will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I have sent. Think about what Isaiah says there about the word of God. We always think that when we talk about the word of God, the word of God is going to go out in the world is going to be fruitful. We always think that God's word is going to come back with blessedness. And we always think that God's word is going to end up like the third seed, you know, lands on good soil. Um, but, but there's another flip side of the word. It's called the law. The gospel, you know, is going to be producing bountiful things in the hearts of people. But the word of God also got the law. And what does the law do? It, it convicts. You know, the Lutheran dichotomy of law and gospel is one of the biggest traits we have in our confession, that when the word goes out and it doesn't become profitable, is God's word, is the purpose of God's word being fulfilled? And how, yeah, uh, yes and how so? It's, it's convicting. The word of God is convicting is convicting them in their sin and in their callousness. And God says, I'm going to say, my word will not return to me void. For you guys who've got callous hearts, it'll just convict you even further. It'll just make your calluses grow even more. But for those who have those calluses removed by the Spirit of God, it will serve the purpose of becoming bountiful. So I've always understood that the word of God fulfills this purpose, like Isaiah 55, 10, 11 says. But sometimes the purpose is not always a blessed one sometimes be a condemnation one. God's purpose always, the word never returns void. It's either, it's either salvation or condemnation. It never returns void. Always gets its job done. Um, so that's why I've already answered question B. Why are many hearers blind? Whose fault is it? It's their own. I, I talked last time we met that it's the whole Pharaoh thing all over again. Remember that illustration I gave? At the very beginning, who hardened Pharaoh's heart? Huh? Pharaoh. Pharaoh hardened his heart against God's word. And at the very end, the narrator says, who begins to harden the heart of Pharaoh at the end? And God does. God says, okay, my word will finish the job. This is where you want to be. My word will now just go to conviction, condemnation. So Pharaoh, because of his own choice, has calloused his heart. So now the word serves the purpose of condemnation. Um, once a person is at the point where the word serves condemnation, is that person beyond hope? No, no. You know, maybe there's another day in which the word's going to work the gospel. So I, I, I when, when can we as Christians say, they're beyond hope. They're beyond. There's nothing more we can do. Yeah, after they die. 
But until they die, you've got to always hope and pray that the Word of God is going to bring salvation rather than condemnation, and pray for that result. And uh, hopefully it will become fruitful in your life with this person you're concerned about eternal welfare. So we've talked about see who is the sower, the seed, the ground. Uh, that was again last time we met. Sower is anyone who spreads the gospel. It doesn't have to be Jesus. The seed is the word of God and the ground is the variation of people's heart. But I like this question. Does the sower seem discreet on spreading his seed? Does he seem to be careful or does he just seem to be careless? So what does that mean? What, is, what, what does that mean for us as Christians? Not even if they're going to listen. Just start throwing the word out. You know? Are we supposed to go to the agricultural county office and say, could you test the soil before I spread this seed? <laughs> no, you just spread it. You just spread it. And who, who do you let the growth go to? God. Let the word go. God's purpose will be that. Whether it be there for conviction or salvation, let God determine that. Just throw the seed. And don't even care on how it lands. Is that being a good steward? I, I, yeah, it would be because that's what God really encourages us to do. You know, I I think sometimes I've heard some people say, "I just don't want to waste my breath on that person." Have you ever heard that? Yeah, and and what does this say? You know, do it because you you can never underestimate the power of God's word. You just can never underestimate. Um, so do we need to find an analogy to this behavior or just see it as a color commentary as far as, um, as, as the source seemingly just sending it out? We just kind of answered that question. So what do you think is the main comparison of this parable? What, how would you summarize this to your children? What, you read the parable of the sower and your child says, what does that all mean? What would you say to your child? You are a sower of God's word. Okay. All right. Should they spread this? Should Should you encourage this parable that your child should spread the word of God at school? Yeah. 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 Um, should he spread it among his or her friends? Yeah. How do you? It should be spread just like the COVID nineteen. Yeah, <laughs> it'd be amazing if it would work like a virus, huh? Yeah. Yeah, it, but it does work like a virus in a way that's got to do one or the other, condemn or or, or save. It does not return void. Um. So, what are the challenges of trying to teach our children to be indiscreet about sowing seeds? <laughs> I, so I had a conversation with Evan yesterday. He asked a very direct question about a uh, social thing that we do normal in our neighborhood. And I'm sure there are many of everybody has has you know, family now is out in, in among us. Um, relationships are different now. Yeah. It's not something that you may see in the movies, it's something you'll see on the street. So he asked me, can women marry women? And I said, yes, they can. They didn't used to be, but they can now. And I failed to, um, I mean, we've talked about it kind of in general terms, that we love people who don't discriminate. We're here to spread God's word to everybody, anybody, and that means loving them. But you get down to that essential, like you can boil it down to that essential, like, but is this right? Yes, God's will. And so, God's plan for marriage. Before I even try to butcher this, because I know I will, <laughs> I take out Romans, and I was like, let's read Romans. Oh, wow. Chapter 2, and let's talk about this, and why is this here? And it's going to be hard to understand. Sure. And, you know, he's kind of tapping out a little bit. But yeah. I proceed, I reread it, and he goes, but why did he give them over? And I was like, because they're hard. We're hard. This is a byproduct of a broken world. So it's legitimate. People legitimately feel this way, but it's a byproduct of a broken world, and right. we are here to be that light. And that's kind of a, 
it's, it's an advanced concept even I have a hard time with. Mm-hmm. And I always have to go back to that chapter and read it. But what you're saying right now is like the fact that condemnation is not forever, that there's always a chance. That's your answer. It's like because there's always a, a chance. chance, you cannot say, I'm going not going to waste my breath on that person. Right. I'm not going to try anymore. Right. Even if it's like, but politically, that's suicide. <laughs> you have to admit that you're wrong. That's the part where I. You're living in sin. You just have to love them and, and live as God expects you to live. That's your yeah. Question answer. The, the answer. I mean, the question to your statement. You have to. What does? How does God expect us to live? Mm-hmm. You know, what is God's plan? And we know what that is. Yeah, but a lot of. Say it. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. No, the only thing you can do is you can just throw the witness out there and let it go. You know, my conversations with others uh, who disagree with God's plan for marriage, I, I'm not going to get in a hard-boiled argument dis- and, and, and start shooting names at each other and calling people horrible sinners and they're going to burn in hell. That's just not the way to get anything done, you know, um, but to engage in conversation and dialogue. And then you get to the point that you can know where the dialogue has to end. And then you have to step back because, you know, if you go past that point in the dialogue, you're just going to do more harm than good. Right. So, but you've given your testimony. And we, again, let God, uh, let God do the work. I'm going to throw the word out. And in and, and, and my dialogue and evangelisms uh, I've dealt with over the years, and, and this one individual, you know, like, proved to me Christianity. And I'm, I'm, I'm like, no, I'm not going to do that. That's not my job. What do you mean? I'm, you're a pastor. Prove to me Christianity. So no, I, I, just because I'm a pastor doesn't mean I'm going to be a proof person. I'm going to be a witness. I'm always a witness. So what I'm going to tell you is I'm going to witness the word and love the God. I'm going to let God take over from there. I'm not going to come in here and try to argue into Christianity. It's impossible. It's impossible. Just understand that you cannot argue people into Christianity. It's a faith. Yeah. So just give a witness and then let the God go scatter the seed and let God give it the growth. Yeah. That's that's all we can do. I don't get into a lot of arguments and debates with these people who are disagreeable with us. It's just um, it just makes it worse. But I do best I can give witness and testimony. Uh, last week we were seeing with these friends and uh, the argument that you're feeling with on the, on the on the alternative lifestyles and this lady that we stayed with she's just totally disagree and she lets it now she wears her heart on her sleeve this is wrong and and her response i mean people respond to her her own, her own children will say to her you're being judgmental and i responded to that last night or last week with her i said do you realize what they're doing there when they say when someone tells you you're being judgmental what did they just do they just judged you you see, we can't get away from this judgment. You can't. Judgment is something you cannot avoid. You can't avoid by saying you're being judgmental because you just become judgmental yourself. And they don't. And many of them, they don't even get that. They don't even get that they're doing exactly what they're accusing the other person of. Um, their hearts are blind. Their eyes are blind. Their ears are blind. They're just. And you just. Give them the witness, and then let God go over from there. Yeah. Anything else to add to the parable of the sword? Yes, Donna. Sometimes it seems like the more you push, the more resentful. Yeah. It's something that you continue harping on. Right. So, like you said, when do you let go? When do you stop? That's where the wisdom of God comes in, and you ask for God's wisdom. Yeah. And then the one one thing I really love about the Christian faith is, all right, I'm going to go as far as this conversation as I believe God wants me to go. And then if I found out later that I didn't go as far as I should, what do we have under the cross? Huh? Forgiveness. You know, that's that's the beautiful thing about this Christian faith is when we recognize maybe we went too far or didn't go far enough, uh, the blood of Jesus Christ is there to heal our brokenness there as well. Tom? I want to ask a silly question just to make a point. As the notes 
in my Bible say the reason that God speaks in parables is for the spiritual dullness of the people. Mm -hmm. Can the unrepentant sinner enter the kingdom of heaven? Depends as, as long as if they're unrepentant until death. But that's what we're saying, you know, you can, don't give up on the unrepentant until they take their last breath. I understand that. Yeah. But don't add any base to my statement. Just say, can the unrepentant sinner enter the kingdom of heaven? Yes or no? <laughs> That's a, uh, that, that, I can't answer that without adding something to it. Well, I understand what you're adding to it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying, just take it for what it is. You're assuming that that person remains unrepentant till the end. Yes. If unrepentant to the end, that would be uh, something, again, you leave to the judgment of God, but for our, our judgment would be probably that he would not be saved. But as... God speaks to us. Mm -hmm. If we are unrepentant to the end, we cannot be with him. Right. Right. Yeah. Why would that's you? all. Okay, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> that is all. Um, I see that Mark adds something to this parable. Let's look at what Mark does in Mark 4, 21 through 25. He adds some extra words to it. Is it Mark 4? Yeah. Mark 4, 21 through 25. He puts this uh, kind of ties in this other parable, a lamp on a stand with it. And he says, Jesus said to them, do you bring in a lamp to put it under a bowl or a bed? Instead, don't you put it on its stand for whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed. Whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out into the open. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Consider carefully what you hear. You continue with the measure you use, it will measure to you and even more. Um, again, it just kind of illustrates that you've got something, don't heal it, don't conceal it. Throw it out there and let God take care of the growth from there. Anything else to add on that before we go back into the parable of the weeds on Matthew 13? This is going to be kind of a little bit lengthy discussion, but hopefully interesting in question number two. Um, Matthew 13, 24 through 30. But Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. While, while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the weeds sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner of servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you're pulling the weeds, you may root up the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Um, <clears throat> in the parable of the net, 47 through 50, uh, it's the same thing as far as uh, the kingdom of heaven is going to have bad fish and good fish in it. Um, do churches, how does a parable, how do these parables speak to the practice of church discipline? On the surface, what do you think it means? If you got a weed in your church, what what do you think the how do you how do you think the Bible speaks about the weeds in the church? These two parables. And that, of the fish, and when does the weed ultimately actually become separated? According, when are the bad fish taken out from the good? At the end. So what does that mean for the current? Should we be worried about the weeds in the church? Should we be worried about the bad fish in the church, yeah or nay? I mean, yeah, but only if I think all things work to the glory of God, even if we don't see that in the current time. So what if the weed in the church becomes making in good wheat become weeds? Should we just let that go? So what do, what do we have to do with the weed? Well, right now, it's like that part where you know someone's sin against you. Uh-huh. 
Uh-huh. You go and talk to them first. And if they don't listen to you, you take another person with you. And then finally to the church if they still don't see it. Yeah. So to me that means you get them to see what they're doing to the church and to people. And if they still don't agree, then you bring it to yeah. or two more and you go talk to them some more. So, but you never, yeah. you never give up on them, right. I don't think. Right. So uh, let's look at that. I'm not going to have you turn to it. I think you're all very familiar with Matthew 18. Who was the one that said the words in Matthew 18, if your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault? Who said that? Who did it? Jesus, right? And Jesus said, you know, through the process of church discipline, how are they supposed to be treated if, if, if your brother doesn't agree, then take two or three witnesses the two or three witnesses are not to be your cronies who are going to side with you. They're supposed to be your judges to make sure that maybe you're the one that's wrong. And so you take two or three witnesses to the event and you have that conversation. And if those three agree with you that this individual is wrong and then they still don't repent, who does Jesus say you tell it to next? The church. the church. And if they don't repent from the church, what are you supposed to treat them as? Paying as a tax collector, which means what has the church just done? Have they pulled the weed? Yeah. They pulled the weed. They pulled the weed. So how do you, how do you, and who, who speaks these parables? Jesus. So Jesus speaks to Matthew 18, and he speaks these parables. All right. Now, talk some amongst yourself. <laughs> how do you work this out? Come on. Talk some amongst yourself. How do you work this out? Yeah, but how do you work it out as, as your dad's an elder and I'm a pastor and we have to look at these things? How do we work this out? How do we work as Christians this parable with Matthew 18? Both of them are coming from the same speaker. Wouldn't that Pray about it. The culmination of where the church separates them as tax collectors and pagans would be in, where, the, where they're all gathered up. It would be in, but does Jesus basically say that they are un, they cannot return? No. no, they could return. So, but you have to make the statement. They're in the wrong. And you have to kind of pull a weed sometimes to help them understand they're in the wrong. Because if you let the weed stand, is the weed understanding they're in the wrong? No. no. So what is our Christian responsibility? This is the argument and discussion I've had with our son Seth. As a lawyer who sometimes has, has struggled with it, over his mind and conscious about defending doctors in malpractice um, because some of these doctors just were just really negligent. Um, and then he went into bankruptcy and now he's got to deal with, you know, foreclosures. And he feels as a Christian, he feels bad about that. And uh, he wants to be kind of like forgiving, compassionate and patient. And I kind of said, you know, Seth, you got to look at Matthew 18, too. And Jesus says we as Christians have also a responsibility to make our neighbor accountable. And so you as a lawyer can be a good Christian lawyer as you make people accountable. The church needs to also do the same. We have to go into these uncomfortable situations in order to make people accountable. Uh, if we don't, we're not doing our job. We're allowing people to live in sin and and then that according to the prophet ezekiel remember how god told ezekiel that if someone if i send you out to someone and tell them that they're a sinner and you don't go and tell them that they're sinning you don't hold them accountable who is god going to hold that blood against prophet because you didn't do your job you didn't i told you to make that person accountable you failed because you're afraid of confrontation but if you go and you tell him and confront and if he doesn't repent then at least it's off your head and it's totally on the individual so we as christians in the old testament as well in the new matthew 18 are called to make people accountable in the body we're not going to be able to make outside of the body people accountable like you know holly your situation with neighbors or whatever i can't go to them but if they're going to be part of this body confession um that's what really kind of protects us about gay weddings in our own church people will wonder will our church have to do a gay wedding well i've always kind of said this is a way you protect yourself from this is that 
you make a policy in your church that only members get married in this church. You will not marry non-members. So if you're a member of this church, what do you have to admit about homosexuality if you're gonna join this church? So therefore, it's not gonna be brought up. It protects you 100%. You know, you only marry members. But if you start marrying non-members, you can get yourself in a lot of trouble. But if you are part of this body, you join this church, and that you, by joining this church, say this behavior, I agree with you, this behavior is not correct. Therefore, if that person is caught in that sin, should we just let it go? Got to call them. Call them. Call them to accountability. I like what Paul does in 1 Corinthians. Take a look at his check with accountability. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. First Corinthians chapter five. All right, I'm getting there finally. Back in Romans, this thing just doesn't. Let's just switch around. All right, Paul. Here's something going on over there at Corinth after he left. He says, "What is what has he heard?" <laughs> Verse one. There's sexual morality among you. And of a kind that, and this, this has got to really be a hammer, right? This doesn't even happen among pagans. Seriously. And you guys are going to let this go? What's going on here? Read further. What is the immorality taking place here? Someone taking their father's wife. Someone's having sex with their stepmother or their biological mother. And the people of Corinth are saying, live and let live. Does Paul agree with live and let live? No. He wants that weed pulled. Because to allow that weed to live within the church does nothing but damage. A man has his father's wife, and, and get this, he says, you're proud of this. Shouldn't you rather have been filled with grief and have put out of your fellowship the man who did this? So he already says, pull the weed. Even though I'm not physically present, I'm with you in spirit. I've already passed judgment on the one who did this. Paul admits it. I'm judging. <laughs> but it's God's judgment. It's not his. I've passed judgment on the one who did this, just as if I were present. When you are assembled in the name of our Lord Jesus, and I'm with you in spirit, in the power of our Lord Jesus present, hand this man over to Satan. So the sinful nature may be destroyed and his spirit saved on the day of the Lord. So why does Paul wish for this weed to be kind of pulled, to be called accountability for whose purpose? For the purity of the church or for the, the welfare of the individual for both? Hmm? For both, right? Because he believes that when you hold this person to accountability, that sinful nature will be destroyed and his spirit saved on the day of the Lord. Exactly, and then verse seven. What does he basically say? Get rid, Get rid of the old yeast, that you may uh, uh, may be a new patch without yeast. Is really are for Christ our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival. Um, and eventually, he gets into the point of verse thirteen. Uh, God will judge those outside. So once he puts out, so in order for them to be outside, what does he tell the people to do in the end of last? Expel the wicked man from among you. Pull the weed. I love 9 through uh, 13. Mm -hmm. Because it talks about the wicked man and how he says that, you know, don't associate with them. Right. But you can't, he doesn't mean that you should not associate with those of this world who sin sexually or with the greedy or robbery of those who worship idols to get away from them, you have to leave this world. So true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're not going to avoid it. You're not going to, but it doesn't have to be part of the body of Christ. Right. Yeah. And that's what I was trying to, I need to, I need to read this up because that's what we were trying to talk about yesterday. And just, I gave him all sorts of examples. Like, what if this neighbor was an alcoholic who we not love them, mm -hmm. even though they're, they're struggling with, with addiction? And, you know, it's the same thing. It's like people are going to struggle with whatever their, their weakness is. And we love them anyway. But you're not going to their house. 
Yeah, yeah. That, that, and he got, she seemed to obsess that because it's been, I want to go play Xbox with their adopted son. He can't. Mm-hmm. But it's not clear why, because he doesn't, he doesn't need to know. Need yeah, to the know. only thing you could do, I guess, is you as a parent are understanding the behavioral action here as far as I, we can only go so far. If we go farther than this, we are actually endorsing the behavior. Exactly. And that's, that's a hard concept. Like, there's some things I can't really explain. He just can't know. Yeah. He can't grasp it. And it's actually a lot simpler. It, I didn't have to explain it. As soon as he said, so they, and then asked the, another question about the extent of the relationship. And I said, yes. And he goes, oh, okay, well, um, I'm going to go Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's what you have to kind of understand and discern is how far can I relate with these people without endorsing their behavior? But in the church, I mean, they join the church. They're in this confession and, and, and therefore they're supposed to, you sign the bottom line, you're supposed to agree with the tenets and faith and what they don't, they need to be dealt with. And it's the same thing. I mean, that's that's really hardcore when you're dealing with sexual incest and sexual immorality. It seems to be kind of easier. I mean, people living together in sin in the church are being, can we just let that go by as well? Or, or do we have to make a statement on that? I mean, if if you allow one to do it, what will therefore it mean for the rest of the body? It's okay. Do you, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. It needs to be confronted unless you're going to be okay for everybody to live in sin. It needs to be confronted. Could you explain to me what this means? No. <laughs> five, five. What number? Five, five. What's the five, five. Yeah. Um, hand this guy over to Satan. For what purpose? To finish the verse out. St. Paul believes that if we hand this individual over to Satan by pulling the weed, the sinful nature will be destroyed. And his spirit saved on the day of the Lord. St. Paul has this concept. St. Paul has this concept that through this handing over, hopefully the goal is that he will recognize his sinfulness and yeah. repent. Yeah. 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 It's tough. <laughs> but he explains in Romans one about the whole behavior and how yeah. God led him over to the base of mind. So if your right. mind becomes so the base, and it, and it gives you that whole point is like Janice was saying as we've talked about it before, handing people over doesn't mean you're done with them. You know, it still means maybe that's what they really need right now. Because whatever's working is not, whatever we're doing is not working. So maybe the best thing we can do is hand them over, and hopefully that'll work even better. I know. And they look at you like, well, yeah. didn't you get told that you weren't supposed to touch it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, in the, in the same thing, and I know I'm out of time, but the, the question of what do you do with inactive members who are part of the body? They make confession when they join the church that they're going to support the church by their attendance, by their prayers, by their, and then they're not fulfilling their vows. Does that need to be confronted? Yeah, you have to have a talk, and, and and otherwise, again, if you let that one say, if you let it go on, it can become universal in the church. I guess we don't need to go to church. It's like one bad apple. Oh, well, you're just using the same metaphor, Gary. One little leaven leavens the whole lump. Right. Yeah. So and that's that's a big problem when you look at church discipline. It's it's difficult to confront people all living together. It's difficult to confront people about homosexuality. If two gays, they had that they had that in the church up in Indiana. I served before I got there. Whew, took care of it. I wasn't had to, but I didn't have to deal with it. But um, you know, and they they confronted it and said this can't happen. This can't be. You know, it's just you didn't when you signed on to the bottom line you agreed that you wouldn't endorse these things um so go to the world with it and we'll let the world judge yourself but you've made a statement here and, and it's hard it's hard because you try to do this as compassionately as possible and you're trying basically in dealing with discipline 
I like what Jesus, I'm going to end with this thought, promise. What does Jesus say about Matthew 18? What is the goal of church discipline? Matthew 18, verse 15, I think it's right there. To win your brother over. If you're carrying out church discipline for vengeance, you're doing it for the wrong reasons. If you're carrying out church discipline to make people re to return to the Lord and, and, and win the brother over, yes. Yeah. So every effort you make in carrying out church discipline must be done out of hatred or love. Which one? Love. 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 Does the person understand that on either side? No. Not easy. All right, let's close with prayer. Thank you for joining us out there. Father, O oh Lord, we thank you for scattering that word among our hearts, and we pray, O oh Lord, through your spirit, that you would not allow our hearts, our eyes, our ears to ever become callous. Keep our eyes, our ears, our hearts always open to your word, so that we may be good soil and produce bountiful fruit. Help us, O oh Lord, to scatter your seed among our worlds, among our soils, and let you do the growth. Help us, O oh Lord, to yet give our witness and not let our witness be deterred or weakened because of what taking place in our world. Give us discernment about how best to do this without pushing the agenda of the word to the point where we do more damage than good. We are always thankful, O oh Lord, for that wonderful gift of forgiveness from Jesus. And we go forward, getting our seed under your grace. In the name of Jesus, amen. All right. Thank you, guys.